Still, look at somebody and say, I still believe. Don't look at somebody like a preacher. Say, I still believe. I still believe. I wonder where your belief is at tonight. I wonder if you live according to what you say you believe. I wonder if during this time of the year where we focus on that word belief, Christmas will do that. We confront our culture to look at different belief systems and different belief structures. And I wonder if you recognize how important knowing what you believe really is. Because we still believe some things that need to be addressed. And I pray tonight somehow the Holy Spirit pushes you a little bit further to explore what you believe. If what you believe is not drastically changing your life, you don't have good beliefs, you have some ideas. But when you believe what we believe in this church, people should see it all over your life. Can I read you the scripture really quick? I thought I would choose something really traditional. Christmas story everybody knows, and this is found in Mark chapter 9, and it's the story of a demon-possessed child. Merry Christmas. And I love telling people about what Jesus requires, about who he is. In this one little passage, we see the character of God. We see the passion of Jesus. We see what he requires for those that want to follow him. And you'll be shocked about what it is. And here's how the story goes. Are you with me? GP, are you with me? Anybody under 22 think, but that is real gospel. That's what it is. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder, and they ran to greet him. And we could preach a whole sermon on why is Jesus magnetic, but most Christians are repelling. What are y'all arguing about? Jesus said. A man in the crowd said, Jesus, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Isn't that just like the devil? You can take one thing, it'd be your voice. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and he gnashes his teeth and he becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Jesus said, you unbelieving generation, what a pastor. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. What a gangster line. Can't you see that in the movie? Bring the boy. <laughs> so they brought the boy. When the spirit saw Jesus, this is interesting, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. And he fell to the ground. And he rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Isn't it funny how when God starts a new thing in you, that means the devil's losing his thing. So don't be alarmed in your life when you start making decisions to follow Jesus and it looks like it's going wrong because you chose to get your life right. Don't worry about the devil having a temper tantrum on the way out of your life. It's going to happen. Jesus said to the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he said. It's often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him, but if you can do anything, please take pity on us and help us. Jesus said, if you can, everything is possible for those who tie. Everything is possible for those that have Bible college degrees. Everybody, everything is possible for those that know every single doctrine and every single piece of theology. Jesus said, for everybody who believes. Come on, somebody. Right. Immediately, the boy's father explained, I do believe. Help me to overcome my unbelief. Isn't that a cool paradox? On one hand, he's saying, I do believe. On the other hand, he's saying, I don't believe enough. Can you help me? That's how gracious our God is. He's not afraid of your doubt. He's not afraid of what you don't understand. He just wants you to come to him. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the sea, he rebuked the impure spirit, you deaf and mute spirit. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Don't you love it that we serve a God that does not negotiate with terrorists? The spirit shrieked, convulsed violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Anybody who's in to see a miracle is going to make some noise. I love this because you read it and you see how passionate Jesus is about people. 
You see how much he wants to include us where he's not asking you to save the world, he already did it. He's not asking you to be a super Christian in New York City. Just like Jesus was asking this man, he's challenging on us on what do we really believe. And I think if we could be a church that's actually living according to what we say we believe, we would see New York City change so much quicker. Now Christmas is a cool time to talk about belief because every movie is about believing. If you just believe in Santa, you know, whole movies about trying to convert adults into Santa, Santa Anity. I don't know. It's late. They're trying to get people to believe in it. Do you believe? Do you believe? Because the idea is the more people believe, the better the Christmas spirit is. And I find this funny because in our culture right now, there's never been a tougher time to figure out what you believe. People actually hate belief. People are running from it because anywhere you look in our culture, what you thought you believed in or what you thought was real kind of ends up being fraudulent. You sure as heck can't believe the politicians. They can't even keep track of their own lives. You can't even believe the news because number one, it's probably from some other agenda. Second, it just might be real fake news. You can't believe in marriage anymore because not just outside the church, but in the church, one out of three couples is probably going to get a divorce. I don't want to believe that. You can't even believe Instagram. Oh. Oh. You meet somebody you saw on Instagram, you see them in real life, you're like, who are you? So we had this belief thing going on in our culture right now where people are like, nah, I'm just throwing it all out. I don't believe in anything anymore. You ever had your belief shaken like that? Where you believed in something, you loved somebody? Oh! <laughs> I do that anyway, it's super well. You ever had your belief shaken? Where you thought you were locked in on something and then everything changes? It can be a hard thing to have your belief shaken. I remember talking to my daughters not that long ago about the truth about Santa. So if you are a parent in here and your child is in here and they are still working with this story, you want to plug their ears right now. Oh. I sat down with my daughters and it wasn't to necessarily expose a lie, but I just got sick and tired every year of my kids giving Santa all this praise. Santa never bought a gift. He never worked a day in his life. He never put these kids on the earth. He doesn't care about them when they're sick. And every Christmas he could be more over there while they're just loving what Santa has done. I said, you know what? This is done. I'm done with this guy getting all the credit for all the work we're doing, all the gifts we're doing, and all the presents we pour, we're wrapping. I'm done with it. So I sat my daughters down and said, look, y'all, you're old enough to hear this, okay? Here's the truth about Santa. And I started to break it down and told them what the deal was. I said, in this house, it wasn't Santa who brought those. That was your mom and your dad. It wasn't Santa who washed you all year. That was me, too. <laughs> Charlie looks at me, and her lip starts to quiver. And she puts her head down in disgust and shame, disappears. Ava stands her like this. She goes, let me get this straight, Dad. <laughs> Mr. Honesty is our policy. So you've been lying to what? us this whole time. I was like, but I got a reason. I mean, somebody was okay to lie. And then it's your dad of the year gone in that moment. But because that belief was shattered, we were able to come in with some truth, a new belief, a new set of rules, a new uh, way of thinking that ended up making our relationship stronger and up making them stronger young women because they're no longer believing stuff they don't need to believe. What if I propose to you tonight that God knows exactly what he's doing as he dismantles things we should not believe in as he puts people and politics and culture on front street and allows it to be the sham that it is so people will stop in beliefs that do not matter and the lightest and the brightest and the strongest belief which is that that we believe in Jesus Christ changes the world. What if we thought that? What if there was no better time than now to start asking yourself the hard question? What do I believe? Have you been believing in other things to save you? Have you been believing in other methods to get your life right? This is the season where you got to be able to say, I still believe it's Jesus. I still believe that the gospel is good news to the brokenhearted. I still believe that our God can touch somebody who is sick and make them well. I still believe that God can use a church in the middle of Manhattan. It doesn't have all the stuff, but it's got all the passion. I believe, still believe that God can 
use a group like us to change the world. I still believe that nobody has run too far. Nobody is unredeemable. Nobody has gone to a place where God cannot reach them. I still believe that he is the redeemer. He is the savior. He is the atonement. I still believe we serve the king of kings. But the people want to hear it or not, I still believe. What about you? Do you believe it? Because if you believe this stuff, it should show up in your life. Do you want um, a quick way? Hold on, let me get some wish right <laughs> you want a quick way to add some more anxiety to your life during the Christmas season? <laughs> if you're really negative, you just said that. Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to know how to add just a little bit more anxiety into your life for this Christmas season? Okay, I'm going to give it to you anyway. Here it is. Ready? Hold untested and under-investigated beliefs. Best way for you to compound our anxious culture with real pressure, real problems, real drama. If you want to make it even worse, try this. Have beliefs that you really don't know much about. Have beliefs that you're trying to build your life on but you've never tested it a day in your life. It is the quickest way to perpetuate anxiety and fear and insecurity because if you don't know what you stand for and if you don't know what you believe, this world will be happy to hustle you to believe in something you want nothing to do with so you better know what you stand for. But I wonder, if you think about that, are you anxious tonight or do you have peace tonight? Because I believe that when you follow Jesus and you believe he is the way, the truth, and the life, you will still see some pressure and there will still be some moments, but you're not going to be shaking in those moments. It's kind of like the girl who dates the guy for about five or six years. She's in love. She's ready to get married, but he's still kind of thinking it through. I love you. I do. I love you, girl. She's kind of working some stuff out. And the girl, you know, she kind of believes, but she doesn't really know. She kind of believes that this guy likes her. But she doesn't really know, so she's never at peace. They don't go on normal dates, they go on tryouts. She's never worn sweatpants and Uggs to dinner. She's got the dress to the nines, church clothes, because she doesn't really know. She kind of believes, but because she doesn't really believe, she's never had the comfort of just being who she is. This is kind of what happens to Christians who don't really know what they believe. So they're kind of excited to be in church, but they also don't know if they're going to make it at the end of the day. They kind of think they love Jesus, but they're a little bit worried about this one part of the Bible they don't understand. So rather than live in the peace of God, they live in the pressure of not understanding what they believe. What about you? I have believed that it caused weird pressure in my life because I grew up in a Midwest church that had passion plays. Good ones too. I'm talking about sitting there as a junior high kid with my parents watching this play. And it was completely pitch black dark and the music was scary and they had a grim reaper come from the back hitting each chair as it went by. I remember seeing this grim reaper and then they got demons and then they had, at that time I had a choir fire meaning it was like a pit where the choir would stand but they turned it into a fire and they were just throwing people in these flames all the time. It was like this far. And then they started throwing words like the rapture. Which, when you hear rapture as a kid, all you hear is, I'm going to hell. Woo! And so for like, like seven years of my life, I lived with this weird, anxious contentment. I don't know if I'm going to make it. If I ever overslept and everybody was going in my house, I would panic, I would pray, and I would go call the three good people that I knew just to make sure they were still here. I didn't call most of my friends because if the trumpet sounded, they were hitting the snooze button anyway. They were like, I don't care if you're here. I want to find that one Christian. One good Christian picked up my call and I'm like, didn't miss the call. You know what I should have done? I should have went and investigated my belief. What does the grace of God mean? What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be redeemed? What does it mean to have a covenant with my God that is not contract based according to what I do? I serve a, a, I serve a covenant God that's according to who He is. What about you? Are you living in the peace of God or in the pressure of not knowing what you believe? My hope tonight, we might turn this into a series because it's so Christmassy. <laughs> My prayer is that we as a church, you wouldn't have to point anybody anywhere else but you. What do y'all believe? Let me tell you about Jesus. What do you believe about that Bible? Let me just throw this out there. Don't let people be dismissive of your beliefs in this culture. It drives me nuts when people are like, are you, are you like a Christian? For real? <laughs> like y'all really like believe that stuff? Like seriously? Like Noah? <laughs> Like, do you really, like, believe the Bible is, like, from God? Which I would say, absolutely. I had a guy recently say to me, I couldn't be a Christian. 
I don't have that much faith. That's why I'm an atheist. I said, my brother, it takes far more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. You have to make so much work logically. You have to dream so big. I don't even have the faith to think about being an atheist, to believe I came from nothing, that I'm here to do nothing, and I'm going to vanish into nothing. That takes some faith. You call it what you believe, but don't let people dismiss it. Secrets of uh, better believing. Write this down. I believe the secret to building a belief system that lasts. It's called beholding. Being in God's presence. Who in here wants to have a belief in Jesus, a stronger faith that you don't get rattled by the storms, you don't get rattled by like anybody. Everybody just raise your hand. Amen. One of the secrets is just beholding. The Bible says in Psalms, it says, "What? Be still and know that I'm God." Because when you are around something, that's why when Joel wrote that song, Behold, the whole point is to make sure people can see Jesus for who he really is. Uh, just a minute in his presence will change your belief, which will then change your behavior. Just a minute getting to know who he is helps you understand who you are in him. And before you know it, you didn't do anything but just be in his presence. But we have such a rushed culture that people can barely carve out an hour of their week to get to church. Let alone chill out and behold God's presence before you start your work week. <laughs> Forget about just kind of sitting there praying. We have people that are so impatient they get mad at their phone. If a picture does not download in five seconds, forget about the fact it's coming from space. <laughs> There's no wonder that we have Christians that are walking around like, I think I'm a Christian. I'm well, pretty sure I'm a Christian. When was the last time you were with the God that saved you? When was the last time you got a fresh word from heaven? That's not your church's job. It's your job to leave this place and behold Jesus for yourself. I'm dedicated to I want to see God do things in my life I haven't seen. I want to know him better. And it's not going to be better church services that's going to save my life. It's not going to be impressive speakers that are really going to get to me. You know what's going to strengthen my belief? Praying. Hearing the voice of God, having the Holy Spirit stir stuff up in me that causes me to pray in a way that nobody else can understand. I believe that when you behold our God, your life better change. Write this down if you don't mind. Don't forget. You don't have to believe everything people say about you. But you do have to believe everything God says about you. I'm not interested in he said, she said. I'm only interested in what God said. And some of y'all need to hear this. I feel like God put it on my heart for a reason. You have believed at face value things people have said about you for way too long because you didn't understand that you had the right to decline that call all day long. There's people in this room right now and you have a belief system that started unhealthy, improper, malfunctioning because the word you received and started to believe was false in the first place. So as a Christian, sometimes you got to trace back in your life and find out, how did I get here? Why do I believe what I believe? And it's amazing what you can uncover when you take a little bit of a deeper look. Remember, you don't have to believe everything somebody says about you. You know, they teach you when you're raising a child, years one through four, it is the most formative years of any kid's life. Their psychology is made, their esteem is made, and it even works years one through four as a Christian. Be careful what seeds you allow to grow because you don't want to start believing something that has nothing to do with the new life God gave you. I read a news story recently about a four-year-old girl who was kidnapped. She was abused. They got a tip that she was being held in this house, and they raided the house, arrested the kidnappers. And they found this four-year-old girl. She had bruises all over her body. And she was bleeding out of her mouth, dark circles under her eyes. And they couldn't get her to answer to any name. And they said, what's your name? She said, idiot. They took her to a social worker. And they figured out the only way she could associate with anything was idiot. Because she thought that was her name. Because that's all they ever called her. So she was responding to something that wasn't from God. It was from the pit of hell. Thank God he didn't in that moment, he brought the SWAT team in to shake up that little girl's belief system so she'll spend another day of her life building on a wrong foundation. Somebody in here tonight, you know what this meeting is? It is a SWAT team from heaven coming into your old prison to make sure you understand. You don't have to believe what somebody said about you. 
Maybe somebody said, you're not going to make it. Do you believe it or do you reject it? Maybe somebody else told you there's no way it's going to happen for you. Did you believe it? Because you have the right to reject it and say, Lord, clear out the old and bring in the new. I don't believe that curse and I don't believe that heritage and I don't believe what they say God's supposed to do. I believe what God said, not that he said, not that she said, only what our God said. Believe that. Sin. <sighs> Series. Series. Two things. Two things that I want you to know that we believe as a church. And our team's gonna get up here and we're gonna worship. I don't know why I just said worship. I flick my head, but I like it. <laughs> but I want you this whole time to start thinking. Why do I believe what I believe? It's one of my favorite questions in New York City. Just ask somebody, like, I don't believe what you believe. Normally people have no idea. They have nothing to say. The most common thing I ever hear in New York City, by the way, if I were to invite somebody to the church, they say, oh, I can't come, I'm Jewish. I say the same thing. So is Jesus. He saved my life. So take it. I'm kind of Jewish. Who told you that because you're Jewish, you can't come to Hillsong, New York City, and enjoy at minimum the best night of your life? Maximum, you might never leave. One of my friends was resolute. That he was uh, Jewish and he's not allowed to come. I said, cool, convince me. I want to become a Jewish person. I'm done with the whole Christian thing. I don't believe it anymore. I want to follow you. Where are we headed? <laughs> he's like, well, there's good and there's bad. How do we know? Uh, well, you know, there's always good and bad. No, it has to come from somewhere. Who's the God? What's his name? How do we find him? How do we track him? What's the deal? I'm sick of this. How do we get our code? How do we get our morality? And after 10 minutes, like, all right, all right, I'm done. When you start investigating certain things, you're either going to throw it out or make it better and bigger. And that's our prayer. I'm going to give you two really, really quick things that I pray you believe with me. Are you still with me at all? No? Yes. Number one, I still believe in healing. Yes. Just because we remain broken does not mean that God has stopped his process of making us whole. I mean it. I still believe in healing. I still believe that we're going to see people in wheelchairs come into this church and leave walking. I still believe that we can pray for the sick and see them recover. I still believe that we can walk into some hospitals and just start praying and believe for people to actually come back to better health. I still believe it. Don't forget during the Christmas season and this cute little story people are peddling, the whole thing is about healing. Our world was broken. It was sick. God couldn't have it. So he sent Jesus to bring healing. He didn't send Jesus to condemn. He sent him to be a bridge so people could no longer live in this broken life. They could have direct access to the king. But I wonder, can you ask yourself this question? Do you still believe that God can use you, even though you're not fully healed, to bring healing to other people? The game changes when you're faced with this question. I want to know, do you really, yeah, you say you believe in healing. Okay, cool then why aren't you helping more people? Why don't we pray for more sick people? The truth is there's a lot of people who are happy to believe God to heal other people, but in their own life, they're like, I'm not ready. I gotta get some stuff organized. As if Jesus ever picked anybody who was ready. But do you believe tonight that God can use you to help other people, even though you're in the process of being healed yourself? What if I proposed to you tonight and you believed it, that God can use you mid-process, that the stuff that isn't healed yet, the stuff that isn't fixed yet, God is still working, and while you wait for that miracle, you can still usher in miracles for other people? Do you still believe that God can use both of people? If your belief in God is that he healed you, and he's continually healing you. It should create faith for you to believe that God can do it for other people. If you're somebody who holds that belief, by the way, we're going to go right here tonight. We're going to pray for it after this. If you're one of those people that holds that belief that I love God, I know he loves me, but there's too much brokenness and there's too much weakness in my life. You're right on both accounts. You're not worthy. There is too much brokenness. But point number three, God's not interested in it. When you're broke, he's not. When you're failing, he's not. So if you're in him, your weakness is less than his unbelievable supernatural grace. So you still have the right to be used. So if you are part of this church, you got to stop believing that someday God's going to use somebody like me. I want you leaving tonight, go 
God, no, I believe as of right now that I'm going to put my hand up and God is going to use me. Flaws and all. Scars and all. All my stories, all my stuff. My God is so good that I believe he can shine through the brokenness of my I remember when I got this revelation because I was kind of in a bad way when I got saved. I had some scars. I had some stuff going on in my life. And some being Christian told me I had a couple decades to learn. Watch out for me, old Christian, by the way. Be very careful. You don't receive everything you say, especially weird prophetic words. I see a relationship in your future. That's not prophetic. Is it 50 50 G? And I was still questioning whether God could use somebody like me as a minister. Man, I would preach the best I could. I would always feel like what good enough. Love people the best I could. Feel like I was failing. I was like, maybe I just need to hide for a little bit, get some stuff together, and maybe rethink about my life. And I ended up being in, this is almost 10, 11 years ago in England, preaching at some London youth camp with Hillsong London. And it was a very terrible experience because I don't like outdoors. It was in a log cabin. I don't want to camp. Y'all know this about me. I only want to camp out in hotels. I don't want to be outdoors with hiking. No hikes unless we're hiking to, you know, a plane. I don't want any of that stuff. And I remember going through this youth camp, preaching my guts out, not feeling like I was really measuring up when we went to a gas station on some back country road in England. And I kid you not, this is all true. Uh, a nun comes out of the gas station. She kind of shuffled over. Kind of <laughs> I was already on the defensive because I just can't think I'm a Christian. She's like, beef with me. And she goes, Are you a preacher? And I was like, Well, yes, yes, Miss Nunn, I am. <laughs> so I knew it. And I'm racing for like some terrible word, something she's angry about. And she's like, I knew it. Are you from Virginia Beach, Virginia? I said, 757. <laughs> she said, you preached the message called Tattoo Me a couple years ago. Somebody sent it to me, and I loved it, so I play it in secret in our Catholic school for all the junior high boys who listen to it every week. It's a great message in the garage. Let me get this straight. God is so good. The preacher was having the most accurate sermon with the biggest reach of a metaphor to win it all the way across the world to a Catholic nun actually resonated with the message which is God wants to tattoo your heart in such a way that even if you tried to hide it, you couldn't and she's playing it in a Catholic school, it wouldn't even let me in a Catholic school. I wonder if you believe that God is such a healer that he will use any means necessary to get healing to others. And it has to mean that you're available starting tonight. If you believe that our God is good, say amen. If you believe that our God can use broken people, say amen. If you believe that your hand is up because you are ready for God to usher in a new season, can you say amen? Amen. Now you're coming. God's off. Amen. Come on up here, team. Where is the most broken area in your life? I want you to think about it. Where's the most broken area? Is it a relationship? Is it something that's going bad with another person? Is there a private habit that's still broken? Don't you dare settle for half a healing. I believe that God came to this earth so we could know wholeness in Jesus. Don't allow sin to incubate in your life because you've just given up the fight. You keep fighting. Who can you reach when you leave here? Who can you call in this Christmas season to bring healing? Who do you have beef against? Who do you not like? Who wronged you that you can make the first step of healing by owning stuff you didn't even do for the sake of peace that God might bring healing? Still believe that God wants to use us as reconcilers. Number two. Number one, what was it? We still believe in. Wow. Seven people are with me. <laughs> We still believe in. We believe that people in wheelchairs can get brain for them walk. We believe that people can walk into our church with a doctor's report that says I got cancer, and we can pray, and they can walk in the next week and say I got cancer. We believe that those who are addicted to heroin in our city. 
even stats say that 4% of people who ever touch that drug will ever be free of it. I still believe that our God is so strong and he's such a healer that people who are in the throes of addiction and they can't find their way out and God Almighty is going to go ahead and save somebody's life. I still believe it. Believe it, number two. I still believe in hope. And let me share with you why I believe it. Is this helping anybody? still believe in hope. And when I say hope, I gotta clarify it because our culture has hijacked the word hope. President Obama ran a whole campaign on the word hope because people like the idea of hope, but here's the problem. Ask people hope in what? Some people are like, I wanna be a hopeful person. What's your hope in? Hope in hope is nothing. Hope in Jesus is everything. So the reason why we use the word hope, we're not hoping by change. We're not hoping to open up our, our uh, what's that thing with the stars? Horoscope. I'm not hoping that my star signs are gonna line up. I'm not talking about when you made my stars. I'm not hoping that I get a lucky break. I got a lucky break. I'm not getting saved when I deserve it. I got hope in Jesus, and that's why I witness, and that's why I worship, and that's why I watch the news on the edge of my seat. Because I got hope in the God who can fix what is broken. I have hope. You somebody like us to help young kids in Syria right now who have no hope. I believe that Jesus can use us. Yeah. You know I mean? Because God said, this is Hebrews chapter 6. Flip there if you have a Bible. Hebrews. Hebrews in mysterious ways. Oh. oh. That was awesome. Lord just said dad joke. <laughs> Which Ava accused me of giving dad jokes as well. Crush me. It's like if you start saying dad joke stuff to me, have fun getting a job and buying your own stuff. I didn't say that. I totally said it. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us. That's a powerful scripture. We can't get into it. Think about that. We have fled what is normal to get what is extraordinary, supernatural, so that we might be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure, that enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. Do you know how powerful the scripture is? The Bible is reminding us there used to be a curtain separating the unholy from the holy. Jesus shows up, rips the curtain, gives us a link that gets us straight into the presence of God. And our Bible is reminding us we don't have to run anymore. We don't have to just hope against hope anymore. We know that our hope is in Jesus. So if he's going, we can go. If he says it's possible, we can believe it's possible. My hope is not in the White House. It's not going to be found on Fox News. My hope is not in the ones that write our checks. Our hope is in Jesus. He's never lost the game. He's made us the head and not the tail. That's where my hope lies. I don't know about you. Come on, check me down if you look. You know how you can gauge yourself right now whether hope in Jesus is fueling your life? Real easy. Look at your interactions with people. You know you have hope in Jesus and you believe he is the hope of the world when you absolutely believe the best in people. That's a hopeful Christian. You ever met a Christian who believes the best so much where you wonder if it's the Red Bull, if it's the coffee? I know that my hope meter in Jesus is high when I see somebody, and my first instinct is we're going to be, we just might be best friends. And the person might previously hate me or hate our faith, but I'm thinking, I'm, God is so good, and my security is so strong, I won't bridge any gap. I'm going to walk over to any room because I just believe God is so good, He just might make us best friends. How about you? You still love people? Or are you angry at something? They voted different. They look different. They sound different. Because if you're a Christian, you got to have the kind of hope in your blood that just says, I don't care how different we might be. My hope is in Jesus. He crosses all the bridges. I'm coming for you. We're going to be friends. You know you have hope in Jesus when you look at things that used to be obstacles as opportunities. I love Christians like that. Like, I see a problem. They see, oh, there's a promise in there. 
That's somebody who is not just a positive thinker. I can't stand that. Somebody said to me today, you're, you're a positive guy. Some of that positive thinking stuff. Positive thinking doesn't change anything. It sells some books. But unless you're positively thinking about Jesus, all that positive mantra stuff, all the kumbaya stuff, all the yoga stuff, if it's not pointing to Jesus, it is a colossal waste of time at the end of the day because it's Jesus that brings change. It's Jesus that dismantles the system. It's Jesus that he uses the story. It's in a positive thing. It's Jesus for us. Thank you. You know that hope is at work in your life. Do you believe that our God is good when you pray like you mean it? I'm going to end there. But I believe this. If I want to find out if somebody really believes when they say they believe, I love to hear them pray. That's when you find out if someone's hope is in Jesus. Because sometimes they'll ask the world for everything. They go to God and they just have these meager little requests. And I go, you don't believe what you saw. You just told me that God loves you. And he's gracious. And he's perfect. And he's just. But you can barely formulate a sentence to the creator of heaven and earth. If you really believe that he loved you, you would go to town on your Christmas list. Like my son Holman did. Roman believes that I can make anything happen. He believes that I have never failed. He is my best friend. We are, like, hanging out all the time. And he really believes I'll make it happen. So if I say, son, give me your Christmas list, he will. I brought it so you can see how big he dreams. This is his Christmas list. It's shoes. Because he's my son. Number one on the list, KD's shoes. Daddy, you can pick. Or Stephen Curry's. LeBron James and Michael Jordan's. He didn't ask for one pair, he asked for many pairs. I said, Ron, that's really sweet, bro. Oh my God, you wanted all shoes for Christmas? Like, Dad, it's a double sided list. Sweat the picture. <laughs> Super 2, Call of Duty, Black Ops 3, Nintendo 3DS, make it red. He's giving me orders. Boombox, baby brother.
lady said to me, cool chick, cool car. She was like, uh, where are you coming from? I said, I'm coming from a funeral. She said, oh, that's interesting, you know, because I came from a funeral a couple months ago. My mom passed. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. She goes, you know what? Can I just fit for a second? You look like somebody I can talk to. And she begins to pour out her life story and her heart. And she just starts going for it. She says, you know what I believe? After I saw my mom pass, nobody honored her. Nobody really cared about her. All she ever did was live for others, like so many people here at church and preach and stuff like that or whatever. I mean, live for others and do all this stuff. You know what I decided? I believe now life is about me, and I'm going to get mine, and I'm going to protect mine. If I can get around to helping somebody, so be it. But this is a new day where i got to take care of me. So I believe the most healthy thing I can ever do is take care of me. What do you think about that? I said, well, to be honest with you, um, I picked up the wrong guy today. Because I don't know much about you, but from what you've told me, you have a gift of passion. You have a gift of faith. God has created you very uniquely. And the devil has tried his best to put obstacle after obstacle in your path so you will stop taking ground. What you just told me is very American and it's very cultural. But you know what's very Christian? To refuse the easy route, which is to live selfish and live isolated and keep on pushing even though it's hard. So what do you do? What do you do for the living? And you can resonate with her. Where you used to have faith. And you used to believe that God wanted to reach a city like this. And you used to believe that you could go to heaven with arms wide open and say, Lord, pour it out. But something has happened. Listen, we need you now to get your belief right so your behavior will be right. And therefore the breakthrough will be right. But we can't do it without you. Some of you tonight in this Christmas season, what if you look back years from now and remember this random night at this amazing venue where you said, Lord, I choose to believe again. God's not interested in your good works just yet. He's not interested in what you think you know. He wants to know, do you believe? Because those that believe and confess, not only do they get saved, but they get to walk with our God. I still believe. How about you? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to pray for people in here that I don't know. Because I believe God knows you. I believe God brought you here in His sovereign grace. I don't believe it's an accident. There are dozens and dozens of new people in this service. Maybe you didn't know what to expect walking in, but here's what you got. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And without Him, all of us fall short. You need to believe tonight that the Bible's true, where Jesus said, anybody who needs me. The Bible's so clear in Romans. Anybody who confesses they're a sinner and says, I believe in you, Jesus, in that moment, your life has changed forever. Your sin is thrown out and God's grace is put in. When I say three, if you want to make the choice to believe again in Jesus, that he is the son of God, that he did die and rise again, if you want to believe in him and know what it means to have forgiveness, when I say three, I want you to lift your hand. If you are a backslidden Christian, where you literally are that girl in the Uber, where you had a belief and you had a relationship with Jesus, but stuff happened. If you lost your way, tonight is your night to put your hand up when I say three and say, Lord, I'm going to get over that. I'm going to push back that, that old season. I'm going to walk into a new season. I believe when I say three, you lift your hand. Tonight is the night of miracles for many. So I want you to think it through. If you die tonight and you have no confidence or assurance of where you'll be in eternity, you can leave here not knowing someday. I believe I'll be with Jesus, not because of what I do. But I believe what Jesus did on that cross and his grace set me free. When I say free, lift it high. You ready? One, Jesus loves you. He died and rose again so you could have life too. The Bible says right now is a time for salvation. Don't wait another day. Three, lift your hand all over this place. Shoot it up high. Amazing. Anybody else, don't be ashamed. Don't worry about the people on your left or your right. They can't answer the God for you anyway. Anybody else say, Lord, I believe Lift it down, all the way up top, I see. All right, we put your hands down. Church, can we stay to our feet? And can we give these people a huge
salvation happens in the moment. The process of being made holy will happen every day until the day you see Jesus. But here and now, you need to know this. We believe that you're saved. I'm going to lead you in prayer. Not because the prayer saves you, but the prayer does align your new confession with the God that sets you free. It's the grace of God that saved you tonight. Open up the eyes of your heart. And this is just a way to symbolize, Jesus, I choose to follow you. So can we all say this prayer together? Say, Jesus, I need you. I am a sinner. And I need your grace. And tonight I choose to follow you. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you've given me forgiveness. It's a new day. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 One more time. stay in worship and just be in God's presence. That's what we want to do tonight. We want to take just a moment. It's the last service of the night to behold our God. Because miracles happen in this atmosphere. If you got to go, go. And if you want to sing, you really got to bring it. Anybody ready to bring it? If you believe that your faith matters. If you believe that your voice matters. I just give it a shot and that sings my soul. I will lead us, but I won't because she's better.
we're sick tonight. So if you're going to go, by all means, go. You don't lose any points for leaving. But if you're going to stay, we're going to believe that God's going to do what he does. And we're going to sing that part about the Holy Spirit. Because we believe that when the Holy Spirit begins to move, shackles fall off. Diseases have to go. Things that we hide, things that we show that we we believe that our God still intervenes. So as we sing, if you're dealing with something that has caused you to lose hope, I believe things in my own life that either have yet to take place or took way, way longer than I thought would take. But God always comes through. Our job is to obey. The outcome is on Him. Though some church or any preacher on any platform can heal nobody. But what a preacher can do, what a fellow Christian can do, is do exactly what God said to do. If anybody's sick, bring them up. If anybody's hurting, lift them up. And the prayers of righteous people will avail much. I want to believe tonight that if you have the courage, you don't have to tell anybody your secrets, don't tell anybody any, any detail, but if you are believing God for healing, maybe it is a broken heart, maybe it is a broken spirit, maybe there is a physical ailment where you have just gotten discouraged of believing in faith for healing, and now you just accepted the diagnosis, I'm going to pray tonight that you reject that call, and you fight until the day you see Jesus again. Holy Spirit is going to free some things up. If you get the courage tonight, take it out from wherever you are and come down to this altar and just start to worship. There's nothing special about this part of the room, but there is something special about following up a spiritual decision with a physical action. So if you feel like you want to pray, if you feel like you want Christians to surround you and believe for breakthrough, as we say, I want you to come down and just lift your hands and just worship. And we are going to believe that God's going to continue to open up the heavens over life of men. Can you say amen, church? And if you're going to stay, bring your faith. Come on, Dad.
where God's leading me, but it's not here. Discouragement stays at this altar tonight. Lack of hope cannot stand in the presence of God's peace is in the picture. So I'm going to pray for you right now, and then we're going to sing in defiance tonight. We're going to sing, and sings my soul. And my challenge to you tonight is to sing it, smiling, just in case the devil forgot about the God who saved you, about the God who already redeemed you, about the God that already set you free. And tonight I'm going to worship. I'm going to worship for some friends I'm believing for. Fight temptation to give up. Be like it's hopeless. Tonight, I'm going to worship on their behalf. And I challenge everybody up here, make a small change this week. It will equate to big things. Be careful what you put in your ears because it's going to come out of your life. So maybe for the next couple of days, maybe just listen to worship music. Be careful about the song in your spirit and the song in your soul because it should be a worshiping song. Don't let the devil steal your voice. That's my prayer for you. So you pray for your healing. You wait for God to do it, but worship in the middle. Can you make that dedication? Can you lift your hands high? We're going to sing in just a moment. And we're going to sing it like we already won. We're going to sing it like we've already seen it. Because the truth is, even if God never does another thing, He's already healed us from a life without Him. Lord, I pray that as we lift up hands tonight, high, it's in surrender of the 